Hey, I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to a couple of people before we jump into God's Word. want to congratulate Josh Crotty making the Dean's List this semester. And it is also our Amen Girl, Miss Bethany's birthday today. Wish her happy birthday, would you? Just want to let you know that uh, after we get done here in this room, we're going to transition into that room and there may be some food afterwards. saying it might be. <laughs> hey, listen, have you ever gone to church and listened to the pastor preach a message and when he gives the, the, the subject matter, you're like, yeah, this has nothing to do with me. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that. You know, like when you're 90 and the guy starts talking about how to parent, you're like, yeah, that's not for me. Or if you're talking about maybe stewarding your income and you're 12 and you haven't had a job yet, that seems kind of unreasonable to keep a child's attention. So we've, we've had those messages before, uh, but certainly uh, tonight's message is, is, and really for this, for that matter, this series, which is called what? Faithful. Faithful. It really is apropos for every single person. Um, whether it's this season or that season, whatever circumstance, whatever situation you're in, it's, it's appropriate because uh, I've come to realize that m all of us have experienced uh, the pain of the unfaithful. I understand that every single person has felt the pain and the disappointment of someone who is breaking this word that Jesus says. He says, um, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So we, 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 we want to talk about all these high ethereal theological issues, but Jesus has this way of bringing us down into the dirt and just saying, hey, listen, before you understand all this high and lofty stuff, why don't you keep your word? And we've all experienced the failure in that and the pain that goes with it. And we've felt it from friends and we felt it from uh, spouses and we felt it from boyfriends and girlfriends and we felt it from uh, our corporation and our company that we work for for years and years and years and all this promise of retirement and 401ks and then it's gone and sometimes our nation lets us down and we've experienced the pain of all of that and we understand why Jesus teaches it because of the pain that it causes. And sometimes, if not often, you're the reason for someone's pain. You're that person who did that. You're the person, I'm the person who doesn't keep their word, who says, hey, I'm going to go do something for you, Tom, and then I no-show. I'm going to be there for you, Jenny, and then I'm not there for you. That's oftentimes us. So as often as people have hurt you with that disappointment, you've hurt them. And, and isn't it great that we could study the faithfulness of God? We could find someone out there that we could grab a hold of and go, wait a minute, there's actually someone who does this thing right. It's not me. It's not you. It's God. God is faithful. He is loyal. He is constant. He is reliable. He is steadfast. He is devoted. He is unswerving. He is dependable. He is trustworthy. He is committed. He is reliable. And isn't it good to be able to, to take all the past junk that we've experienced and cause others to experience and leave that behind and go straight at this thing called faithfulness so we know what it looks like and we understand that we're, we're capable of this thing. God wouldn't teach you something that you are not capable of doing. If he did, I wouldn't want to serve that God. And we are studying his faithfulness. Um, that means a consistent pattern of reliability displayed over time. Um, is this God loyal all the time, every time, over time? Is he dedicated all the time, over time? He's a, we're looking at a consistent pattern of reliability so that we can walk forward in confidence knowing that we're behind us is not wreckage and carnage, but we have a 
a pattern of this faithful God that wasn't like all the rest of us that let everyone down and didn't keep their word. But back here, there's this God that time after time, he kept his word. And you can trust him and move forward in confidence because you can look back and see consistency. And that's what we're doing. And so in a pursuit of a visible, consistent reliability of faithfulness, I want to start by just sharing three verses with you that are undeniably connected to each other. I want to say before I give you these verses, um, you will not see page numbers on the screen tonight because there's way too much. You couldn't keep up if you tried. So just listen up. I, I, there's more Bible coming at you than you've ever, 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 ever heard in your life. So don't try to keep up with writing. Jot some things down where God would speak to you, but don't try to look it all up now. But test my words and write down the verses, if you will, and test them later. I want to start in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God says something interesting. We studied Abraham before, didn't we? We studied Abraham, and God made a promise to Abraham, didn't he? He made lots of promises. He's going to, have, he's going to be the father of nations. He's going to be a nation. What's a nation? It implies that there's going to be people. You've got to have some people to have a nation, right? You've got to have a king. He says there's going to be kings in this nation. You've got to have a king. You've got to have people. And what else is a nation going to have? Dirt. It's got to have some land, right? So you've got to have some land. You've got to have some people. You've got to have a king. Duh. Look around. Kind of worked, right? King Jesus Two and a half billion of us, and we're spread across the earth. I think God's doing a good job. Right? So part of that whole story with, with Abraham is Genesis 12, 3. He says something really, really, really interesting to Abraham. He says, all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham, something's going to happen because of your life. You're going to die. Like, everybody dies. But something's going to happen special through your life. You watch. Well, well Abraham's not here anymore, but undeniably attached to Genesis 12, 3 of these all peoples being blessed through you, Matthew 1. Matthew 1, 2 says, Abraham fathered Isaac. And if you go there, you're going to see 40 generations to follow. Boom, 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 boom. Starts with the roots in the tree with Abraham and Isaac, and that tree grows and branch after branch after branch. 40 generations goes by, and in verse 16, Mary gives birth to this Jesus. For God, so, listen, the promise is that, that all the people will be blessed through this. And, and, and for God so loved, what? The world that he gave his only son. And the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Titus 2, 11, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all. And in Luke chapter 2, when, when the angels show up, and, and Jesus is born, and the, and the shepherds are in the field, and the angels show up that night. There were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Yes, for all people. And so I want to do as the author of the book of Hebrews would do. As he exhorts the reader in Hebrews 3.1 to do this. To consider this Jesus. Some translations would say to think carefully about this Jesus. Like a lot of people know who Jesus was and what he did. But have you ever thought, the Bible says don't just think about it for a moment. Like oh that's kind of good. He's the guy on the cross. He's the Christmas guy. He's the Ricky Bobby guy on Talladega Nights. Like, no, no, consider the, this Jesus. Like, think about this. Ponder, wonder, research. Consider him. Think carefully about this Jesus, and that's what I want to do with you tonight. I want to ask you to pray with me to start out this process of considering. Father, your word is clear that we are to consider this Jesus. And so, Lord, we want to submit ourselves to you right now. We lower ourselves. Like, we, we may not be bowing, but let our hearts be, be bowing before you right now so that we would submit ourselves right now to the authority of your written word. 
that, Lord, you would change the way we are, change who we are by changing the way we think. Lord, I pray that you would help us to know the truth about Jesus Christ. To know him is to know life eternal. And Lord, we are pressing in right now to know the Lord Jesus. That's what we want. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and do that work, Lord, to open up our awareness, to take Jesus off of this fairy tale figurehead and make him real to us, to understand who he really is, that we might have a greater appreciation, which would be followed by greater worship of Jesus. No matter who we are here tonight, Lord, no matter how many years we have worshipped you, let our worship increase. Let our worship get better. Let our worship be more passionate here tonight and, and forevermore because we consider this Jesus tonight. Speak to us now, Lord, through your word. Lord, please, please use me for your purposes. In Jesus' name. So 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all of God's promises have been all. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. That's a big claim, man. That's a big, big all of God's promises are a resounding yes. I don't know how many promises he's made, but that's a lot, right? Listen, I, I, I don't know about y'all. I know we live by faith, not by sight, but I need some evidence. I need evidence. Listen, I don't want, I, it's, we could talk about faith, and we could talk about living by faith and not by sight, but at the end of the day, it's difficult to give ourselves over freely and aggressively to a God that we don't know. I would love to just have a, a community filled with thousands of people right here, Revolution Church family, of everyone just giving themselves over freely. When the Lord says, hey, jump, you start jumping. When he says, talk, you start talking. Like, I, I would I want you to go to the ends of it. You just start calling American Airlines and make a ticket. Where are you going? I don't know. He'll tell me when I get there. Modern day Abraham. <laughs> like, I would love that, but you know what? That's not going to happen if you don't know who he is. Who wants to give themselves over to something that you don't know? Nobody does. I need some evidence. So, okay, so here's the promise. Here's the promise. Daniel 9 Verses 24, 25, and 26 all talk about this most holy one, this anointed one, the Hebrew would read a Messiah that would come and end rebellion, end sin, atone for our guilt, and to bring an everlasting righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him who is this person. Is this Jesus, the promised one, don't just yell out yes. Do you know? Is he the promised one? Can you point to why you believe that? We need to know, right? Has God kept his word in the person and work of Jesus Christ? Has he been faithful to bring about a nation? Is he faithful to bring about a Messiah? And is Jesus he? That's the question, and so tonight, I want to title my message. I don't do it too often. The title of the message is, What's the Chances? What's the chances? Basically, what is the chances that this Jesus is the one that fulfills all the promises of God? What's the chances of that happening? Look at your neighbor and say, what's the chances? Awesome. So let's start right here, okay? You guys ready? You ready, okay. Isaiah 7.14 states that this Messiah would be born of a virgin. Well, we all understand the improbable. <laughs> How's that going to happen, right? The impossibility, the improbability. Well, I, I, I don't know that that would ever happen. Do me a favor, though. Look in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement 
quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, whether you believe that there was a virgin birth or not, I will say this. The only one that's ever, ever made the claim to be born of a virgin is Jesus. Nobody else has ever made this claim. So let's at least give him that. Like, no other claim for any other person. No one has ever said, hey, there was this, this, was, there was this guy, there was this girl who was born of a virgin. Like, no one has ever even attempted to make that claim. Luke 2, 7 says that she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in strips of, strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. No lodging? What do you mean no lodging? Mary and Joseph, they lived in Nazareth. Well, this is super, super important. We're talking about what's the chances of this person being the one that all of God's promises about the nation of being blessed to all people and that there'd be a Messiah who would take away rebellion and sin and atone for guilt and bring an everlasting righteousness. All of this, is it in Jesus Christ? Well, Micah 5.2 opens a curtain for us and there's a little glimpse into the future and it says this, but you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past. Look at your neighbor and say, that's weak. That was a weak translation. Holman Christian Standard says of this ruler for Israel that it would, he would come from antiquity, comma, from eternity. Now that's a little bit better. Because when you read about distant past, you kind of have this sniff of, well, what, does he mean some, a little bit more than old? Holman Christian standard is a little bit better from eternity, but Psalm 90 verse 2 says, from everlasting to everlasting, I am God. And so the King James Version of Micah 5.2 says that this ruler of Israel would come from everlasting. Who's come from everlasting? Only one. Only God has come from everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting, I am God. Not you, not me, not Billy Graham. No one. Only one. And so when it says that Jesus would come from everlasting, that's a claim of deity. And so what does this little village of Bethlehem, <laughs> that's, listen, did a little research on this, Bethlehem. It's 70 miles from Nazareth. And the only way to get there is over the roughest desert mountains in all of Israel. Like it's a mount, it is, I'm telling you, if this thing is Israel, you know how Israel's shaped like this, right? You know what I'm talking about, kind of. Humor the preacher, right? It looks like this. There, there's one city here and one here. 70 miles, right? You can make it 150 if you want to go around. But if you want to get there, right here is the biggest, most rugged, awful terrain you could possibly go over. So what does this Bethlehem have anything to do with Nazareth? What does it have anything to do with anything? Well, if you go to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says that at the time the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, say he wasn't on God's team. Yeah, not at all. He decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Oh, great time for a little weekend getaway, huh? Hey, honey, why don't we have a, let's just have a weekend, a little R&R &R in the mountains. Okay, S 70 miles with your pregnant wife on a donkey or a camel 
or maybe at worst on foot. You think they wanted to do that? Now, I've never been pregnant, but when you're like super pregnant and your hormones are going off the charts, are you like in a really good mood? Hey, let's just go for a little vacation in the mountains. <laughs> on the back of a donkey. It sounds to me like that's the last thing Mary and Joseph wanted to do. And so for all those that would think that, that, that somehow God's people are putting together, they're, they're fabricating this stuff to make Jesus somehow real, you think that's what Mary and Joseph wanted to do? They, they wanted to go 70 miles over the mountain, pregnant, on foot, on a camel, on a donkey, in the heat? You think that's what they wanted? I think that's the last thing that they wanted to do. Sounds to me like perhaps something else was happening here. It sounds to me that Caesar Augustus, who, by the way, is not a Christian, doesn't have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of him, telling him what to do, was actually doing God's work, unbeknownst to him, of course. All people, a virgin and the right village. What's the chances of this actually happening, right? Not good, not good. Well, these are the stories of Jesus' birth. But you know what? Jesus grew up, much to the dismay of Ricky Bobby. I get it. He likes baby Jesus the best, and he makes all the money, and he prays to the baby Jesus. But he grew up. And, and we need to move beyond the Christmas Jesus, beyond the religious icon, beyond this, this figurehead, and, and move into this Jesus who is alive, who is working in people, who is saving, who is building the church, who is the creator, who's trying to do some things right here, right now. And so the, the text progresses too, as I hope you will. Some people never leave Christmas Jesus. And that's sad. He's more than just this, this anemic looking, glow-in-the-dark, Casper looking doll inside of your nativity scene. He's real. And he's alive. And he's in you. And he's He's saving people, and he's convicting people of sin, and he's building his church, right? That's what he's doing. And that's the Jesus we need to get to know. Here's another messianic prophecy, not just to be checked to see if it ever came to pass, although that's important to do to see the credibility. Is he reliable? But we want to observe how God is keeping in motion his promise to Abraham of a nation and in Jesus as the fulfillment. So Isaiah 42.1 says this, my chosen one, who pleases me, I have put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Well, first the virgin, and then the village, now the voice, but not the TV show. All four Gospels record of this extremely awesome historical event. Yes, it's historical, but bigger yet, it's a powerful spiritual event. Look at Luke, if you don't mind. Look at Luke. This Bible is going to drive me crazy. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22 says this. I distracted you, and I want to read that verse again. Isaiah 42, 1. My chosen one who pleases me, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. Now, remember something that was said 800 years before Jesus was born. And in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, 800 years later, what happens? One day, when the crowds were being baptized by John, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him. I'll put my spirit on him. And a voice from heaven said, almost exactly what Isaiah said. You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. And some translation says, and I am pleased with you. Exactly what was stated in Isaiah 800 years earlier now has just happened to Jesus Christ. Virgin, village, and now voice. What's the chances? Let's move on. Zechariah 9.9 says this. The Messiah will come riding on a donkey. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. <laughs> okay, let me 
me just tell you what the story is. So Jesus looks at his disciples and says, hey, listen, guys. I want you to go into that village. It says that he pointed. I want you to go to that village over there. And when you get there, there's going to be a donkey tied to a post. Yeah, what's the chances of that happening? He hasn't been there. Unless he has. Just saying. I want you to go to that village and I want you to go get that donkey and bring it to me. And when the owners question you, which of course they're going to, right? In Lake County, it would sound like this. Ch-ch-ch. So when they question you, just tell them, why do you, when they say, why, why are you taking my donkey? Oh, the Lord needs it. Ch-ch-ch. Right? The Lord schmored. Right? Come on. Right? So listen. So they go to the village. And guess what? There was a donkey sitting there. Just like he said. And guess what happened? The people who owned it, who by the way, they're not on the team, are they? They weren't on the team. They didn't know what was going on. They said, hey, why are you taking my donkey? And they said, well, the Lord needs it. And they said, okay. (laughs) What's the chances, right? (laughs) So what's the second person of the Trinity doing on a donkey? What is the one who, it says that he spoke in the heavens and the earth were formed, that all things were created by him and for him, and nothing that was created was created other than from him. What is he doing on a donkey? I'll tell you what he's doing on a donkey. He's doing something that's almost as uncommon as creation itself. He's keeping his word. That's what he's doing. He's keeping his word. He cannot deny himself. He always does what he says he'll do. He's faithful. The amazing thing about this is these people, these donkey owners, they weren't on the team. They had no idea. But God causes things to happen because he cannot deny himself. He's faithful. It goes on in Zechariah. Here's another one. It goes on in verse, in chapter 12, verse 10. It says, of this anointed one, listen carefully, they will look on him who they pierced, and they will mourn for him as for an only son. And they will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who has died. Now, interesting choice of words by Zach. It's almost as if God's spirit was kind of guiding him to say these things when you consider that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Colossians 1.15 says that Christ is the firstborn over creation. Now, m- many people like the Jehovah's Witness would say that this means that Jesus was the first and best and highest of the creation. Well, could this be true? Well, if Colossians 15, uh, 1.15 is true... And they would claim that it is and that it means that, that he is the first and highest and best of all creation. Well, then they also would believe that 16 is true. But 16 says that through him, everything was created in heaven and on earth. So Christ is not just the first and best and highest of creation. No, he is creator himself. That's who Jesus is. And it says that they will look on the one they pierced. Could this also happen? What's the chances of this happening? They will look, listen to the choice of words, they will look on, right, right here, they will look on the one that they pierced. Mark 15, 39 says this. The Roman soldiers, the ones who pierced him, stood facing him and declared he truly is the Son of God. That's exactly what the prophecy said would happen. Listen, are those Roman soldiers on the team? No, No, they're not on the team at all. But they did exactly what was stated hundreds of years earlier, prophecies they knew nothing of. They're not part of that religious system. They wouldn't have known this. 
They, they, listen, why would, why would any of these prophets even talk about piercing? The Roman, that was a practice of the Roman Empire. And that, the Roman Empire didn't even exist yet. How about that? What's the chances of that happening? They knew nothing of Zechariah. So it would seem, I mean, at least the trend, that all of God's promises are yes in Jesus, although all of God's promises are an extensive list that we're not going to go into tonight. We're just talking about messianic promises, of course. And how many, how many messianic promises are there in the Bible? I mean, you do a little research, it's all over the map, right? Some people, are, some experts, lots of experts out there, right? Some experts say there's 160 in the, in the Old Testament. And some people, some experts say there's 400. I heard 365, I heard 353. In 1979, this very well-respected pastor, theologian, author, Josh McDowell, he wrote a book in 1979 called The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And in that book, he stated that after careful study of God's word, that it reveals 300 references to the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled. 300 of them. Now listen, as I've been going along here tonight, I've been telling you, I tell you one, and I'm like, what's the chances of that happening? And you're like, no chance, but it did. Like, one, one. Okay, he says there's 300 of them. What's the chances of that happening? Well, I'm not prepared to declare that there's 300. I'm not that expert, and I don't know. But I will say that there's a bunch. There's a bunch. And uh, I've only got six so far that I've given you here tonight. So let's just, just consider this Jesus, right? Six. Just six. Six things that were promised and completely fulfilled in this one person. If nothing else that proves his faithfulness, he is reliable time and time again. But what are the chances that this one man, Jesus, could somehow pull off all six of these things? The chances of pulling off one, when you think about someone giving a prophecy in this land 800 years ago, and all the things that could have happened, and all the people that were born, and all the wars, and all the religious uprisings, and new kings, and, and old kings, and this king gets killed, and new empires, and all these things are happening, and you're born over here, and that cousin dies, and this, all this stuff that could happen, and somehow the person who was prophesied to be sold for 30 pieces of silver is, how does this happen? Unless, right? Unless God is faithful. Augustus, Caesar Augustus wasn't on the team. He's not a willing participant in any way, shape, or form, is he? The Roman soldiers that killed Jesus weren't on the team. The donkey's owners were not on the team. And, and listen, Jesus wasn't even born yet for some of this stuff. So how could he be influencing it somehow when he wasn't even born? As a human, how would he influence these things? What's the chances of six things like that coming? Well, I want to tell you about a guy. This guy's name is Peter Stoner. Can you put a picture of him up there? I don't know if you guys ever heard of this guy. He's... He's one of these like super smart guys. He's way smarter than me. He was a mathematician. I don't even know my multiplication tables. But he was a, he was a professor and president of all these colleges. I got a couple of them listed here. He was the chairman of mathematics and of astronomy at Pasadena College. He was the chairman of science at Westmont College. And he was curious, like, what, uh, what's the chances of Jesus pulling off prophecy? So they took one, the silver coins, like sold for 30 pieces, and they figured out, like, like kind of like, I don't want to equate Vegas to Jesus, but they can equate the odds of something, right? They, they, took, they look at all the circumstances of this football team versus this football team and, and all the different players and their statistics and their history and, and home field advantage and the weather and, and who's playing and who's injured, and they come up with odds, right? It's not perfect. We know that. 
but it's usually a pretty accurate thing. Like, if, if the, the best team in the league is playing against the worst team in the league, you kind of know, right? Like, could it, could it happen another way? Could, could any given Sunday, right? Someone could, the bad team could beat the good team. But chances are, uh, okay, so this guy's like, all right, well, let's figure out. So they figured out the chances of one prophecy coming to pass. And then he said, he went to his students, his math students, he said, listen, let's take this one and let's, let's expand on that. Let's figure out what are the chances that Jesus Christ could fulfill eight messianic prophecies. Of all the things that could be involved, nature, geography, kingdoms, kings, family, illness, distance, time, everything that would be involved. And what are the chances of Jesus pulling off eight of them. They came to the conclusion that it is one, can you put that up? That's it. One in 10 to the 21st power. Okay, one in 10 to the 21st power. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me or you. I just told you, I don't know my multiplication table, so that means nothing to me. So I need to know what that means. Okay, now, if you... Just to give you an example, this is what, this is what he, he came up with. He said, what does that mean? Okay, so I was driving down the road the other day. We were, we were on a motorcycle ride yesterday, and I saw in Howie that there was a piece of land. There's land all over the place for sale, but there was a piece of land that was 187 acres. That's pretty big, right? Does anybody in here own 187 acres? Like, that's big. You can, you can lease that out for hunting, right? That's a big piece of land. You could, you, could, you could march around that all day and never get to it. That's big, isn't it? Okay. So, he said that if you took silver dollars, just like that, and you covered the entire land mass of earth, which is, show that, 36.8 billion acres. Okay? That's a lot of land. 36.8 billion acres of exposed land. That means ice, too. Anything that's not underwater. 36.8 billion acres. And you covered every square inch of that with silver dollars, like you just saw on the screen, 120 feet deep. And you took one coin and put a black dot on it and hit it, and then told a blind person to go find it, that's the chances of Jesus Christ accomplishing eight messianic prophecies. Mind blow, right? Mind blow. That's the chances of him accomplishing eight. That many. So let's just continue the mind blow and take a look at Isaiah chapter 53, probably the most famous in all of scripture. They're going to just come at you quick now. Isaiah 53 is the most concentrated scripture when it comes to messianic prophecy. What, what this Messiah would do, who he would be, 800 years before Jesus comes, this is what Isaiah says. In verse 5, he says, he will be pierced for our rebellion. John chapter 19, verse 17 says that when they came to Golgotha, the place of the skull, on the hill called Calvary, where Jesus would be put to the to the cross, it says, there they nailed him to the cross. And, and those that were assigned to put him up there to make sure he was dead, the Roman soldiers were, who were unaware of this Hebrew prophecy, of course. It says in John 19, 34, that one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced his side with the spear, and immediately blood and water flowed. That's just the seventh prophecy you've heard tonight. What's the chances of that happening? In verse 8 it says, 
He was unjustly, he'll be unjustly condemned and led away. Very similar verbiage in verse, verse 9 where it says, He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. Verse 5, he was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Luke 23, verses 13 through 16. Then Pilate, you know who Pilate is? The Roman governor in charge of Jerusalem. He called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people, and he announced his verdict about Jesus. Remember something for a moment. Unjustly condemned. He had done no wrong and never deceived anyone, right? That's what the prophet said of the coming Messiah. And here's Jesus Christ brought before the Roman governor. And he says, you brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence and find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Listen, nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. Perfect! He reads on, read on. So I will have him flogged, and then I will release him. Do you know what flogged is? Flogged means they take a leather whip with all these strands of leather and at the end of it you attach bone and chunks of metal and concrete and you whip the person and as the as you whip them those things at the end dig into the skin and then you aggressively pull it back and rip the flesh off of his body you think that's what jesus kind of wanted to do that day that's not really what anyone would want what's the chances because he's faithful, doing that for you. That's why. Why is, why is the innocent being whipped? Because he's faithful, right? Because he's faithful to his word. This is what he said would happen. So he willingly goes because he doesn't have a choice. This is what's supposed to happen. I cannot deny myself. Verse 9. Isaiah 53, 9, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60. As evening approaches, Jesus is on the cross for you. Isn't that awesome? Jesus is on the cross for you. Hanging on the cross. Gave up his life willingly for you. Because it was God's good plan to do this. Because he is faithful. As evening approached Joseph, a rich man. Wow. What does it say? He was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of a rock. What's the chances? Verse 7, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Luke 23. Luke 23, 8 and 9 says this. Herod, who was the king of the Jews, was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he had heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. And the king, now listen, the king, who had Jesus' life in his hand, so to speak, at any moment, right? 
You don't disrespect the king. And the king says to Jesus, question after question, it says. But Jesus refused to answer. As the sheep is before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. I want to close with this. Isaiah chapter 9. What's the chances? For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. And why did God do this? Why did God ride in on a donkey? Why was, why was Jesus born of a virgin? Why was he whipped and beaten and didn't say a word? Why did he do all these things? The passionate commitment of the Lord of hosts will make this happen. Because he's passionately committed. Because he, he cannot deny himself. Because he's, he's unwilling to let his reputation be flawed. Because of his namesake. That's why he's doing all these things. That's why he did all this. What are the chances of his happening? Really good. Because that's who God is. That's why all this happened. He is faithful to his promise to Abraham to build a nation. And he is faithful to his promise in Daniel to send the anointed one who would take away our sin and our guilt and give us an everlasting righteousness. All of it, yes, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the Jesus I proclaim to you tonight, and I hope that you know him as your Lord and Savior. If you don't know him, listen, I don't know everybody in this room, and I don't know what you've been taught, but before you tonight, you saw there's no chance that this could happen. Listen, one to the, out of 10 to the 21st power, one silver coin with one black dot, 120 feet deep, covering 36.8 billion acres of land, and there's one coin with one dot. That's the chances of one person fulfilling eight prophecies. He fulfilled 300 prophecies. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, right? And if you, it, listen, there's no other... Signif There's no other significant person on this earth that you could ever talk about that could ever say that they did that. No other person could claim that he is God. No other person is from everlasting to everlasting except Jesus Christ the Lord. And no one else can save you. No one else can secure your spot in heaven forever except Jesus Christ the Lord. He's the promised one. He's the anointed one. He's the one sent to take away your sin. And you need to say yes to him. And forever secure your spot in eternity. And so if you want to do it, listen, who could, what's the chances of this? Who could pull this thing off, right? Who else to trust with your eternity than this one? Than Jesus, who could do this, right? Let's get up out of our seats. Come on, come on, come on. Get up out of your seat. Get up out of your seat. Yeah, it's worth clapping. He's awesome, right? Jesus is awesome. Listen, if you want to say yes, you can say yes. You can say it right where you are, right? Play some music for us. We're going to worship him right now, okay? We're going to worship him right now. But, 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 but don't let tonight pass without saying yes to him. He pulled this thing off to secure your eternity. And just say yes to him. Just say yes to him. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Ask him.